Hello and welcome to this week's TAB Telecast. I'm Pastor Timothy James Farrell and I serve as the founding and lead pastor here at the TAB. We hope you find this week's TAB Telecast both informational and inspirational. We also want to invite you to come worship with us some Sunday morning in person here at the TAB. The TAB is located at 1845 West Hovey Avenue in Normal, Illinois. And here is this week's message. Well, this fall, we've been in a series of messages entitled The Storms of Life. And if you've missed any of those messages, they're, of course, archived for you on the tab, uh, Facebook page, YouTube channel. And now we're on Rumble. Some, somebody say Rumble. You know, that's just a fun word to say, Rumble. And uh, uh, so, so you can join us on any of those platforms at any time, and you can tune in and uh, receive a word from the Lord and... Uh, uh, we trust that you that you do that. Well, during the month of November, we're extending our fall message series, The Storms of Life. Today, I want to talk to you about a storm that probably affects, like so many others that we've studied this fall, the vast majority of Americans and the vast majority of people in the world. It's called the storm of debt, the storm of debt. While the storm of debt certainly doesn't affect everyone I do believe if we had to put a percentage on it, this, this storm probably affects upwards of 95 to maybe even 99% of Americans and people in our world. While the storm last Sunday that we discussed, the storm of disease and sickness and infirmity, that affects everybody. There's not a person on this world that's going to escape the planet without probably having a cold or the flu or just, just not you know feeling yucky. Uh, in fact, there's a the, the walking pneumonia is walking all over Bloomington Normal right now. And uh, lots of people are coming down. We're getting prayer requests for, for having uh, congestive colds and all of that. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You probably have maybe even had a sniffle or two over the last several weeks. The storm of disease was last Sunday, and that affects 100% of people that, that you and I know. But this is probably a close second. The storm of debt. The storm of debt affects hundreds of thousands, millions, and dare I say, billions of people. It has the power to destroy dreams. The storm of debt has the power I've seen as a pastor to destroy marriages. The storm of debt can take your marriage down. I've seen it happen. It has the power to destroy families, to cripple careers, and of course one's financial world. It's been recently said that the average college graduate graduates with upwards of twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars in student loan debt. I know some students who have over a hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt. The storm of debt does not only affect the youngest among us; it also affects the oldest among us. It affects the uneducated and the educated, the mature and the immature. This storm affects so many people. And unlike so many of the other storms that carry, you know, the chilling winds and dark clouds and thunderbolts and lightning, we can see these storms sometimes even on the horizon of our lives. The storm of debt doesn't come in darkness. It comes with rainbows and cupcakes and sweet tarts and lemonade. It's that new shiny thing, right? That's the storm on the horizon. It, it, it's something that we can't live without. And the next thing you know, we're, we're being trapped by it. The storm of debt is subtle. It's sneaky. Uh, the, you wake up one day and all of a sudden you're, you're head over heels in its grip. It creeps into our hearts, into our lives, into our marriages, into our businesses. The storm of debt can even affect churches and governments. How many of you know we've heard a lot, certainly over the last several, several weeks and months here in America about inflation. We've heard a lot about the economy in the United States of America and specifically the debt that we as a country hold, which I believe, now don't quote me because it's ticking right now by the hundreds of millions, you know, so I'm not gonna, but I, the last I heard it was something like $66 trillion we as a country are indebted to the lender. President Franklin 
D. Roosevelt in 1932 said this. He said, any government, like any family, can for a year spend a little more than it earns. But you and I know that a continuance of that habit means the poor house. Over the past few months, our national leaders have been talking a lot about recession, a financial depression due to the drastic amounts of inflation, financial debt that not only does our American government carry, but many, if not all or most Americans have. Because the majority of Americans owe more than they make, each year the liberty of spending and boosting the economy, of course, is being cut short. When Americans do spend money, too often it's money given to them on credit with high interest rates, which merely promulgate the storm of debt and increases its destructive force and power in their lives and, of course, throughout our nation. What is debt? Write this down. Debt is something one person owes to another. That's what debt is. You owe something to someone else. In this instance, we're talking usually finances. You owe money to a, a lender. King Solomon in the 10th century before Christ said this about the power of debt. Proverbs 22, verse 7, Just as the rich rule over the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. And if you're in debt financially this morning or you're watching me online, you know that scripture's true. Because what does the storm of debt do? It shackles you financially. You want to go and do A, B, and C. That's what you want to do with your money, but you can't because you owe X, Y, and Z. I want to say today I'm so grateful for this church that we're debt-free. We don't owe anybody anything. Everything we do, we pay in cash because debt is slavery. And you know what? It has freed us to be able to, whenever God tells us to do something for somebody, to simply write a check or go out and buy it, and we're not in debt to anyone. Praise God. Hallelujah. I wish every church could say that. Because debt, if we had to be honest, we all know it, is slavery. Debt tells you what to do with your money rather than you telling your money what it's going to do. Can I say that again? Financial debt is The debt telling you what you're going to do with money rather than you telling your money what it's going to do. It's craziness. It's the tail wagging the dog. And if you've ever been in financial debt, you know it's crippling. It's frustrating. It's angering to be able to say, oh, I wish I could could give $100,000 to reaching people for Jesus, Pastor. I really do. I wish I could give more. But... I owe this and this and this creditor. The borrower is what? Servant to the lender. Some translations of the Word of God don't use that nice little kind of contemporary word servant. Really, it's slavery. The borrower is enslaved to the lender. You owe something to someone in your life. The New Testament says this about debt. Romans 13, verse 8 says, Oh, no man anything, that we go on to read the rest of that verse, says this, but to love them. Really, you know what we owe one another? We owe one another to love one another. Because the greatest commandment, Jesus said in all the word of God, in fact, it sums up all the law and the prophets of the Old Testament. It's very simple. Every single one of you can memorize it. Matthew 22, 37 through 38. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you will do that, you'll fulfill all the commandments. Love. We owe no one, we're not to know anyone, anything but to love you. I owe you love. Romans 13 verse 8 says, pay all your debts. You know, we all make purchases. You know, when that bill comes around and hits that mailbox. Come on now, you know what I'm talking about. And, and it, it, isn't it interesting, the Lord led me. I wish I could say I was this smart to be preaching on this the first Sunday of November, but I'm not. I just follow the the, the, the wind of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit had me preach this message on the first of the month. Why? Because most of our bills hit our mailbox on the first of the month. Yeah. 
every once in a while, I, you know, I, I open up my little mailbox and think, well, maybe it's not here this month. Maybe, maybe, maybe they forgot about me, right? Oh, no, no, no. It's amazing how, how, how uh, mindful my creditors are of me. Amen? Because they send those bills out the first of every month. Well, you know what? We're all going to get debts. We're all going to get bills. But what are we supposed to do with them? We're supposed to pay them. We're supposed to pay them all. And we're supposed to pay them all off if we can. Why? Because debt is slavery. Romans 13, verse 8 in the Amplified Version says this. Keep out of debt and owe no man anything, right? This is God's will for us. Why? Because God, our Heavenly Father, knows what financial debt is. It's slavery to you and I, and it shackles us financially to doing what we want to do with the money that you worked hard. I mean, come on now, some of you worked hard, some of you didn't work hard, but some of you worked hard this past week for that paycheck. Can I get an amen from somebody that worked hard? Amen. Yes. So let's look at how we can surf the storm of debt this morning rather than be sunk by it. I want to share with you 10 Ps real quickly to surfing the storm of debt. Number one, if you're in financial debt, and I'm probably speaking to A lot of people here this morning at the tab, I'm certainly speaking to a lot of people online. This is a good message, and I'm here to give you hope and to give you guidance and direction because I've been in debt. I know what it's like to be enslaved. I know what it's like for God to tell me to give $10,000 to someone, and I don't have it. Well, Pastor, would, would God do that? Yeah, he would. Absolutely he does. And he will to you if you really get your heart and life on line with God. Because just like we learned about last Sunday, I was talking with someone after church, the currency of heaven to earth is faith, right? Everything from heaven gets to earth and into your life through faith. The currency of hell is fear. Everything comes up from the pits of hell through fear. So faith is the currency of heaven. Fear is the currency of hell. What's the currency of earth? What's the process of exchange in the earth? Money. That's why the Bible says money answereth all things. In the earth, if you want something you don't have in the earth, what do you do? You don't go to, I was about to say Kmart. I don't even think there are Kmarts anymore. You don't go to Best Buy and, say, and get what that big, you know, 68 flat screen TV and take it up to the register and say, you know what, well, I got faith for this thing. I've got faith you're just going to let me walk out of here with this brand new shiny 68 LED TV so I can watch the Bears lose today. They will look at you and call security. But if you walk up to that cash register with that 68 flat screen LED TV and you've got check or a debit card or cash in your hand it's the currency they'll let you walk out of it without calling security because money is the process of exchange that's why the enemy please listen to this this is why the enemy seeks to enslave especially christians because it shackles us from what from from doing what god wants his church to do I've said this from the onset of this church. Some of you were there on the day this church was born 17 years ago, and I've been saying it for 17 years, and you know what I'm getting ready to say. It takes money to do ministry, and it takes more money to do more ministry. I have television channels, studios, calling me up, writing me, wanting us to go on national TV. Pastor Tim, we got to get this word out. Your, your voice is a needed voice in your generation, our generation. Would you come and would you, would you buy, because they don't give it out for free, would you purchase 30 minutes on our Christian television channel? I said I would love to, but I don't have the money right now to do it. It's money. You want to reach more people? It's going gonna, it's gonna to cost money. For those of you in business, it's called advertisement and marketing. Marketing isn't free. 
You got to pay for that ad in that magazine. You got to purchase that ad on television. Come on, are you with me? Amen. So we got to get free from this from this storm called debt so that we can be liberated and do what God's called us to do in these last days. 10 Ps to surfing the storm of debt. Here we go. Number 1, I'm going to move through these quickly, believe it or not. Pray. If you're in financial debt, if you are battling a storm of any type or kind, the first thing I've taught you all to do, the first thing I do is what? Stop and pray and seek the counsel of God. Get God on the scene. Say, God, I'm in trouble here. God, I need help. You know, when we get sick, what do we do? We pray, God, heal me. Well, why don't we pray when we're in the shackles and the storm of debt to God? And say, God, help me. God, give me wisdom. Give me guidance. Give me direction on how to surf this storm rather than be enslaved by this storm or sunk by this storm. James 1 verse 5 instructs us, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. God, give me wisdom financially. Give me the grace, the wisdom, the knowledge to get out of debt, to stay out of debt, and to start living the prosperous life. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives, oh, isn't this good, generously to all, that includes you, without finding fault, and it will be given to him. Amen. You know what? I pray for wisdom every single day of my life, many times, every single day of my life. God, give me wisdom for this. A situation comes up in the ministry, in the family, on the job, whatever. I, I, I go to God. God, give, God, lead me here. God, God may direct me. Order my steps. Give me wisdom for this. And guess what? He does it. And he'll do it for you because he's no respecter of persons. Ask God to help you, and he will. Proverbs 2, verse 6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. In fact, he wrote an entire book called Proverbs from the wisest man outside of Jesus Christ. They're little... Uh, colloquialisms, little words, little phrases, little sentences that Solomon got from the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, and we have them right here in this book. When was the last time you read Proverbs? There's wisdom about marriage in Proverbs. There's wisdom about, about, about health in Proverbs. There's wisdom about business in Proverbs. There's wisdom, wisdom about finances in Proverbs. Amen. Just wisdom, if we will what? Listen to it and apply it. So the first thing we do is we pray, we seek for wisdom. Number two, write this down. Prepare a written budget. Prepare a written budget. More times than not, most people that are in financial debt have no idea how much money they make, they have no much money they spend, or how much money they owe, or who they owe. I want to encourage you, just get out a piece of paper, a legal pad, whatever, write down all your sources of income, how much money you can take in, write down all your, 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 your sources and requirements of debt and see where you are financially. Take time to list assets. Take time to list liabilities. Take time to list debits. Take time to list debts. Get a working knowledge and an overview of your finances. What is a budget? A budget is a bridal in our mouths, just like that bridle in the horse. You need that bridle on that horse so that that rider can what? Can steer that horse. A budget steers us, steers us clear from, from more debt and steers us away from this storm. A financial budget decides and determines what we spend, where we spend, and when we spend. A budget is a simple plan for stewarding finances that God has given us. It's a safeguard against spending money we don't have, as well as increasing awareness of what we so don't have. A budget will help every one of us live a simpler life managed by us rather than our lives managed by our creditors. Because I want to be able to tell the money that I make what to do versus the money telling me what it's going to do. Prepare a budget. Number three, 
Purpose in your heart to stop excess spending. Excess spending is just increasing financial debt on debt that's already there. In other words, stop going on those shopping sprees. Oh, man, I got to look down here. People are going to get mad at me today. You might not have to take a vacation for the next several years to get on top of this storm and to surf it. Stop purchasing the toys, the trinkets, what we call the once in our lives, and spend your money on the needs. Again, get a handle and get a grip on your financial world, or it'll get a grip on you. This is why it's vitally important to, again, put it on paper. What are the needs that I have? Not my greeds. I didn't say greeds. I said needs. What are the needs that I have? And pay those, pay those down and pay those off. It doesn't mean you can't spend. It doesn't mean you, you can't uh, go out and purchase something that you want. It's just you're not purchasing it now. You're delaying gratification. And that's hard for us as Americans because when do we want it? That's not true. We wanted it yesterday. <laughs> Come on now, you wanted that new car? Yesterday. Matter of fact, I wanted it last year. I wanted that house last month. I don't want that house. Come on now. I want those new pairs of shoes yesterday, right? And so we as Americans, they call us what? A consuming culture. We have a, a culture of consumerism, and which is no wonder why our debts are through the roof, not just as a country, but as a people. Here's the good news. Once you're living debt-free, you can then begin to spend money on those excesses in life. When you're debt-free, purchase everything you want because, watch, you're free to do so. Oh, here's, a, here's one of my favorite points of this, of this message here this morning. Perform plastic surgery. You know, plastic surgeons, they fix up faces of Hollywood actors and actresses. But, you know, every single one of us might not have a degree to perform plastic surgery, but we can perform it. We can get out a a pair of scissors. We can reach into our pocketbooks and purses and get those credit cards out and start performing plastic surgery, start cutting them up. Someone say, cut them up, cut them up, cut them up, cut them up. Yeah, those credit cards are our problem. Perform plastic surgery just this afternoon. And don't just cut it once. I mean, go to cutting. I mean, make sure that ribbon and that, that chip card is good and destroyed. Because you can't tape it all together. We can all perform plastic surgery. Get rid of those credit cards. And in its place, here's what most financiers give us guidance and direction, instruction on doing. Get a debit card. You know, we've, isn't it interesting that our country and our world is trying to move us out of a cashless system? Why is that? Well, there's lots of reasons. Number one, I believe they know that if we would ever just go to a, a, a system of credit, our debt will continue to spiral out of control. Because there's nothing like credit. I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. Let me give you a little personal testimony. I remember the first credit card I got. It was in college. I think it had a credit line of like $500. And I thought, Woo, someone just gave me $500, and man, this thing is hot in my pocket. I got to spend this $500, right? And I went out and spent it. I think I probably bought $501 worth of stuff. It's fun because we think, oh, that's not our money. It's free money. It's not, is it? Because we know most credit cards. You know what the interest rate on most credit cards are now? 20 to 30%. 20 to 30 percent so if you buy something at a hundred dollars you're going to pay really 130 dollars for it are you with me perform that plastic surgery you will have a blast this afternoon while you're watching the bears lose get a debit card because what does a debit card do it operates of course just like a credit card but it pulls cash out of your checking account and it keeps you from spending money you don't have Number five, write this down. Talking about the storm of debt today. 
pay off smaller debts first. Once you've got that budget, list the smallest debt first, then the second smallest, the third, the fourth, till you get to the larger ones, all right? Start paying off those smaller debts first, whatever that is. Pay that one off first. Take any birthday money, any anniversary money, any bonuses and benefits you get at work on your job, and don't go out to Candyland and buy everything right with it. Take that extra money and start applying it to your debt and do the smallest one first. Then after you pay that off, what do you do? Number six, I'm glad you asked. You start paying off the larger one second. And you start applying the payment of previous debts to the next payment, to the next payment, to the next payment, until you've got all 15 of your creditors paid off. And your, your livelihood hasn't changed. You're just taking that money and starting applying it. It's like a snowball. You just start snowballing it. And the next thing you know, over weeks and months and years, the raindrops of this storm begin to dissipate and disappear from your financial world. Number seven, plan to not take on any new debt. And this is, this is a decision that each and every one of us make. As we're getting out of debt, I'm not going to take on any new debt. And then once you're out of debt, you've got to be disciplined financially to say, hey, listen, now we're not going back to that thing. Because debt is what? It's slavery. It shackles us financially from doing what we want to do with the money that we make. Amen? So you've got to determine, you've got to decide, listen, I'm done. I'm over. And if I don't have the money for it, I'm not going to do it. All right? Plan to take on no more debt. You know, the, the people that are giving us those free credit cards, they know some facts about us and the consumeristic culture that we live in. I want to share these with you. I think you know them, but I'm just going to put them up here just to remind us. There's three consumer facts that, that we're taught and told about spending that they know that most Americans don't. Here it is. Number one, the more television people watch, the more they spend. If you watch TV for a few hours here this afternoon or tonight, isn't it interesting how they interrupt your desired programming with commercials? And what are commercials? The shiny new silver thing. Mindy and I, yesterday, Hope played a softball tournament in O'Fallon all day. We got back home, got cleaned up, hit the couch, had some, had some dinner. We just put on TV, watched one of our favorite shows. And it was continually being interrupted by these things called commercials. I don't like commercials. And we're just sitting there. And we're looking at this thing. And, and there were like five commercials in a row. And four out of the five were about purchasing new automobiles. New cars, new trucks, new boats. Come on now. You know what I'm talking about because you've seen them. And guess what Mindy and I did? We, we, we got online. We got on Sam Lehman. We got on Heller. We started looking at new cars. We started looking at, hey, 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 hey. And, and next thing you know, I'm, the Holy Spirit like slapped me. I said, what are you preaching on tomorrow, boy? I said, oh, I said, what are we doing? I said, get off that website. Dear God, we're going to, the, the car we wanted, I mean, oh, we picked it out. We had it. We were driving. Oh, I could see my. Leaning back in that nice, fresh leather seat, smelling that new car. And you know how good the new car smells. I don't know what they do to put in that. I mean, where does that car, what smell come from? Because it sure as heck doesn't come from Detroit. I've been to Detroit. And Detroit don't smell like that. I mean, we saw it. We said, oh, this would be great for vacation. We could do this. We could do that. I mean, we, oh. I mean, we, were, we were ready to go all in. Amen. And then we looked at the price tag. And the automobile that we were looking at was $80,000. No. <laughs> and it wasn't that we wanted it. 
And watch this now. It doesn't mean we can't have it in the future. You want to write me a check for $80,000? I'll drive that Tahoe tomorrow. Amen, I will. Because the process and the currency of earth is what? Money, right? And somebody could come up to you and say, you know what? I want to give you $80,000. I just feel led of the Lord to give you $80,000. Well, hallelujah, I know exactly what I'm going to do with that. Are you with me? So it doesn't mean you can't have that thing that, that you have in your desire. It just means you don't want to have it now and go into the storm of debt. Are you with me now? Are you seeing this thing? Number eight, here's a good, oh, no, 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 excuse me, i got to go back. Number two, the more catalogs and magazines people look at, the more they spend, right? Because there's ads in those catalogs, there's ads in those magazines, the new silver shiny thing. And you ask yourself, how in the world have I lived without this? I've got to have it, and I've got to have it now. I mean, one of the things I think most of you probably have come to love as we do in our, our home, the Farrell household, is Amazon Prime. That is a wonderful thing. I wish I thought of that. Because we just prime it. You can order today, and it's on. I mean, we've ordered some things, and we got it the same day. I mean, that's quick. That's quicker than the Chinese. Delivery man. Quicker than the pizza boy. And you can get it the next day. Are you with me? That Amazon Prime, I mean, it's a dangerous thing. Because we can get it. We can get it now, right? Number three, the more shopping people do, the more they'll spend. Come on now. We used to have things, I know, let me talk to the younger generation. Because you know nothing about this. There used to be things not too long ago in our community and in our country called malls. Remember malls? Remember how beautiful malls were? You just go into a mall and, wow, look at all this new stuff. Shoes, clothes, belt buckles, dresses and suits, makeup and cologne and perfume. I mean, they, they got it all. Hallelujah. And you go into that mall and it's like, I wasn't planning on spending anything, but I, I, got, I got bags. Come on, how many of you have had bags on every finger walking out of that thing? Because you had to have it. That's what they know. They know this. And they keep putting those ads on television and catalogs and magazines, shopping centers, to get us what? To spend more money, to go into more debt. Watch this now. Making them rich and us poor and making us slaves as borrowers to the lender. Number eight, persist and never give up. Once you make that decision, I'm getting out of debt. I'm going to be debt free. I'm going to be free from this storm, the storm of debt. I'm going to what? I'm not going to give up. It's not easy. Because here's the reality. You know, we might have gotten in debt in a moment's time. We might have made a super large purchase one day, but it's going to take weeks and months and sometimes years, sometimes decades to get out of it, right? So you've got to be persistent. This isn't always going to feel good, but if you won't give up, here's what I've got good news for you. God will help you, and God will deliver you from the storm of dead. In fact, Philippians 4 verse 19 says this. My God shall supply all of your what? Needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. You know, we all need money because money is the currency of earth. God knows that that is a need. And God knows that every church has a money need. Every church has a budget. Every church has a vision that God has called it to do and God's called it to fulfill. And God says, I want to supply you not just with your physical needs, your spiritual needs, your emotional needs, your relational needs. I want to supply what? The financial need. I want to bless you financially according to my glorious riches. Why? Because God's a good God. And God is fully aware of the financial needs of our lives. And he will partner with you if you'll partner with him to destroy the storm of debt. Number nine, write this down. Purpose in your heart to serve God and not money. 
Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 24, these words, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve, look at this, both God and money. It's impossible. There, there's, there's, there's almost like a spiritual battle when it comes to, to money or to what we call mammon in the Hebrew because of this loyalty issue. You know, it's interesting, again, in our fallen human hearts, we have no problem spending money we don't have, especially when it comes to us or to those that we love, say our children, our grandchildren, right? Come on now. But if God or a pastor like Pastor Tim would get up in front of a congregation and say, hey, I want to raise such and such money for the kingdom of God, isn't it interesting? For most, the first thing that comes up in our hearts is no. I can't afford it. I don't want to do that. Are you with me? Because we were more loyal to ourselves and to those we love than we are loyal to God. And Jesus said you can't serve both. We've got to be faithful to God, faithful and dedicated to Him and to His will and purposes for our lives. And then watch this now. Here's the great thing about it. Once we do that, then we're the masters of the money, not money masters over us. Because every slave has a master. And money is a slave if, it's, if, it, if you're in debt. But if you'll make Jesus the Lord of your life, and if you'll make Jesus the, how, do, how should I say it, the, the, the life coach and financial coach of your life, you know what he'll do? He'll help you and he'll give you, again, that goes back to point number one, he'll give you wisdom on how to get you out of debt, and then he'll give you wisdom on how to prosper and how to be blessed. How do I know that? Because I'm a walking, living testimony to this thing. I've been in debt. I've pastored churches that have been in debt. And I can tell you right now, it's better to be out of debt than in debt. It's more liberating and freeing in every single way to know that, that, that I am not enslaved to this thing. Amen? And I can do whatever God wants me to do with the money and the resources that he's entrusted to me. Number 10, the 10th P to surfing the storm of debt and not being sunk by it is this. Plan on stewarding money God's way. When we choose to manage money God's way and we do what he tells us to do, we'll defeat the storm of debt. God said through the prophet Malachi to his children these words in Malachi chapter 3, 9 through 10. He said, you are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and most of you know this, but I'm going to repeat it anyway. This is the only area that God gives us permission as his people and his children to test him on. You've got a, you've got a green light to test God when it comes to your finances, when you do it God's way. Just try me, God says, and see if this thing won't work. He says this, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out whew, so much blessing that you're not going to have room enough to contain it. Now, how many of you want to sign up for that? How many of you want to sign up for open heaven financially over your life that God can bless you so much financially that you don't have a bank account large enough to contain it? I want to say, God, try me. But first he says, try me. Manage money my way. Steward the resources financially that I give you my way. Plan to do what I tell you to do, not what you want to do or what your money is telling you to do. And how do we do that? There's numerous ways, and I preached on this. I preached entire sermons on this. But the first way is this, and I don't want you to miss it. God says this. 
bring the whole tithe into my storehouse. Now, what is the storehouse? The storehouse is the, the house of God, the church. What is a tithe? The word tithe means tenth or 10%. So if you make $100, we're to bring $10 to God. That's the tithe, that's the tenth into the storehouse. And I've taught you for, for years that tithing is for toddlers. It's, it's for those in the nursery. But most Christians aren't tithing and they're wondering, well, why, why isn't God using me to do this and do that? Because you in the nursery. God's not going to get you out of the nursery until you start doing things God's way. Tithing's for toddlers. Don't tell me how spiritual you are and you're not tithing. This is just entry-level stuff. It gets more from there. Can I say this? I left tithing a long time ago. This church left tithing a long time ago. This church gives upwards of 20 to 25% of the annual budget each and every year out. That's why we're debt-free. That's why God just keeps blessing us and pouring us on financially. Because when he comes in, we just, we just start blessing people. We start giving to people. And guess what? God says, there's a church I can bless. There's a church I can pour out finances on. And I'm believing. I'm believing this. I'm believing that. I'm believing for this. Your pastor needs to I'm believing for millions of dollars to come into this church. So that millions of dollars can go out of this church. So that hundreds of millions of dollars can come into this church. So that hundreds of millions of dollars can come out of this church. See, if you'll just be a vessel, if God can give it to you and trust it, he'll just, he'll just keep blessing you and blessing you and blessing you. If I owned a business, and I don't, but if I did, here's what I'd do. I'd make God my business partner. I'd say, God, I'm going to tithe off of everything that comes into this business. Matter of fact, no, I'm not, God. I'm going to give you 12%. I'm going to give you 15%. I'm going to give you 20%. Mindy and I, I'm going to close with this testimony. A few years back, we tried God on this thing. And we were tithing. And I said, you know what? Uh, our current finances isn't cutting the lifestyle that you and I want to live. I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to try God. We went from giving 10% to giving 20%. And we couldn't afford it. We really had to rein in our excess spending. 20%, God. We're just going to, everything comes in. 20%, 20%, 20%. You know what happened in less than six months? All of a sudden, her financial world started being blessed. She's a realtor. All of a sudden, I started getting benefits at work. I mean, all this stuff. And all of a sudden, our income, our salary rose, watch this now, to the exact tithe we were giving 20%. Test me in this. Try God out. And you know what he'll do? He'll come through for you. He'll show you. That's what we do with this church. We don't tithe. We give 20 to 25% every single year to people, to, to ministries, to fund the kingdom of God. And you know what God's doing? God's blessing us financially. Now watch this. This is very important. It matters the church you go to. It matters the pastor you listen to. Because whatever gets on the head, gets on the body. You connect yourself to a local congregation, whatever's on that, Guess what? Can get on you. What's on God's house can get on your house. How many of you like to be debt free like the tab? How many of you have like no financial worries ever again? How many of you like to be so free financially that if God told you to do X, Y, and Z, you could do A, B, and C? Amen? If you're not there, pray to me. Get your heart right with God. And say, God, I want to be, I want to be a part of what you're doing in the earth. I want you to bless me financially. And if you'll bless me financially, I will bless your work. I will bless your people. I will help the hurting and the homeless. We give to homeless ministries. We give to those that are destitute. This church I'm talking about. And why do we do that? Because God can trust us. Here's the thing. If God can trust you, he'll bless you. And then when God blesses you, here's the trick. I'm going to tell you a secret. Once God blesses you and increases you, you prove yourself faithful. Prove yourself faithful with that thing, and it qualifies you for more blessing. Don't get sticky fingers. <laughs> Don't get sticky fingers. Let it, if it can hit your hands, 
and leave your hands, God will just keep blessing you. God will keep blessing you. And it's a joy. I can tell you right now, it's a joy for me and Mindy. It's a joy for this church when God gives us an opportunity to help somebody and we help them. It's almost like someone once said in Acts 20, verse 35, it's more blessed to give than to receive. It is. It truly is. Because when you give, you qualify yourself for more blessing. It's when we keep that the open heavens close over our lives. If you'll just give, if you'll just be a giver, it'll come back to you. Romans, Luke 6, 38, give and it'll be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Will it be given back to you? There's 10 Ps to defeating the storm of debt in your life. I believe, because I practice these, we've practiced these as a family, we've practiced these as a church. And we've seen God intervene and work miraculously. If you'll test God, if you'll just try God and His Word, He'll prove faithful. And He'll bless you, get you out of debt, bring you into a place of prosperity. The Bible calls it the land of milk and honey. The land of overflow. And when you get in that land of overflow, you just keep overflowing it. You keep blessing people around you. It'll keep coming back to you since you can give more. And you can give again, you can give more again. And it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. Let's close in prayer today. Gracious God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your wisdom. We need it, especially when it comes to our finances, Father. And Lord, help us to manage money your way. Help us steward the resources that you've given us your way so that we might surf the storm of debt and not be consumed by it. Lord, I pray for every person here today. I pray for every person watching online that is, that is in this storm. And they would say, Pastor Tim, you are preaching to me. This message is right on time. I need to be delivered from the storm of dead. If that's you, I want to pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, you know these people. You know their financial problems. You know their financial world. I pray, Lord, that you would lead them, guide them, direct them to money, manage money your way. And as they do, you will equip them and empower them and deliver them from the storm of debt to live the blessed and prosperous life, to be a blessing to others. This I ask and pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen and amen and amen. Would you put your hands together today for the word of God? Hallelujah. Well, there's a lot more to this message uh, that I could have.